So I don't know about y'all, but I can identify with Martha in this little story, running around trying to get some. If y'all see me before service, you know I like to be busy with the hands and do things and feel like I'm doing something, right? And it's really easy for us to get caught up in that and to get caught up in the rat race and the going to work and the doing the things. And we need an escape. I'm going to fix that. We need a vacation. Amen? Anybody need a vacation? It's summertime, right? So a couple weeks ago, our family got to go down to Rockport, and we got to take the kids to the beach for like the first time. Oh, that's so much better. I had a headphone in. We got to take the kids down to the beach for the first time since Minnie was like this big. Now she's nine next week, two weeks which is crazy. But we got to take the kids down to the beach, right? And we, we, we go down there. It's about four hours away, and we get to watch the kids play in the sand. And, like, I got, I think we each got about 20 minutes to, like, <sighs> relax. And when I was doing that, when I was standing out in the ocean without any kids around, at least not mine, I was looking out at the ocean. And when you see that vastness of the ocean... It made me feel small. And it made me feel almost insignificant or powerless. And I started to think, out here in the middle of the ocean on vacation, right? I started to think about all the worries and the problems and the preparations I still had to do when I got home. And just for the rest of the day, you know, family vacation. It's a vacation for the children, not a vacation for the parents, right? We got to, especially with small children, Jack. <laughs> You've seen him. <laughs> but I got wrapped up in my problems, and I and I and I lost sight of the moment because I started thinking, and I even wrote this down. Looking at the kids from the ocean and feeling that small, and looking at the kids on the beach, I started to wonder if my kids are grow gonna grow up in a world full of fear. And I started to think. Man, are we even going to like financially make it to the end of the year this year? Is our car going to make the four-hour ride home? Where did I put my phone? And then I thought about work and how are we going to grow this church? And I thought about the people I care about. And I thought, what's the next bad news text or call going to be about? And then I thought, how, how can I lend a hand? And then looking out at my kids playing on the beach, I said, is Jack eating sand? <laughs> he wasn't. Maybe. Maybe he was. I don't know. But I had to catch myself from worrying about all that stuff to live in the moment and to be more like Mary and sit and listen to what was around me. To zoom way out and get perspective by looking at the big picture. Watch my kids make those memories and take time to be aware of God's presence and creation despite the fact that I was on family vacation. So anyway, we made it home. And as I was sitting, flipping through the pictures that we'd taken of the kids having a good time, I started to gain some perspective, Right? You look and see, well, they had a good time. Maybe they'll remember this. And if they don't, we got pictures to prove it. We took you to the beach right here. Like, we did good. We did do it. And I started feeling a lot better looking through those pictures. And then I saw, Randy, if you go to the next slide, I saw this. And this is one of the newest pictures from the James Webb telescope that's out in space right now. And what we're looking at here is like millions of galaxies and billions of stars. It's the farthest we've ever seen out into space. And I looked at that, and I felt again like I felt in the ocean. I felt small. And I felt like, wow, what a big world. Because to take this picture, it took like three different space agencies. There was NASA, the Canadian Space Agency, and I think the European Space Agency to build a telescope that had to fold itself up to be able to fit into the rocket, to launch into space, and then unfold in space 
and then take these wonderful pictures that we see. Randy, can you go to the next one too? And like this is seeing beyond the stardust. This is farther than we've ever seen before, which I just thought was so cool because you get to see God's handiwork. Like God made the heavens and the earth, amen? And there's still dust in heaven, so don't worry about when you're cleaning your house, right? But then, I mean, how do you feel when you look at that? You, you can feel small, you can feel insignificant. It's kind of like when we look at the problems we face in life, the big problems, the problems like world hunger, the problems like the real, actual problems in your life that feel too big to get a hold of, the problems in your family and in society. And sometimes we can feel powerless, vulnerable, and even worthless. But what if we could look at this and not feel small. But we look at this and feel large and important. Because we are called to be the hands and feet of Christ, right? We are able to be part of, part of the solution to the world's biggest problems. We are, in order to do big things, you have to start with small things. In order to do something, you have to start. Solve world hunger, you can start by feeding your neighbor. One of, are you worried about the next generation and all of the happening in the world and all this stuff? You can be somebody's mentor. If you have an addiction, you could admit there's a problem and seek help. If you're unhappy with where you are in life, you can take that first step to that new finish line that you can define and go after. Because everything starts with a small step. And what if we looked at what Jesus said in Matthew when he said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. It gives you some perspective. Because God made all of that. All of those millions of galaxies and stars and stardust and just the expanse of space and time was created by our God. But not only did he make that, but he made you. And that's pretty cool. And not only did he make you, but he breathed life into you. And you are a living being. He made you in his image. He sent his only son to save you. That's pretty cool. That makes me feel a little bit bigger. Because when we look at this, the billions of stars and millions of galaxies, but we might be the only group of particles that know we exist. Because the only beings in the universe that have been given the gift of life and consciousness is us. Because see, in our brains, we have around the same number of neurons, of little connections, as there are in the Milky Way galaxy. And those neurons, obviously, are much smaller than stars and more ordered in the fashion that they are put together as far as we can tell. And arguably, they're more complex than these stars. So if you think galaxies are amazing... Think about how wonderfully and fearfully you were made. Because the vast majority of the particles in the universe, the vast majority, don't know they exist. They have never wanted something. They have never looked at something and thought it was beautiful. They have never built a super cool space telescope to take pictures of outer space. But they've never made their kids breakfast. They've never driven to work. They've never found themselves in church. We are special. And we are powerful because we are recipients of the gift of life, the gift of knowing God's love for us, the gift of following Jesus, and even just the gift to know that we exist and can look at that and feel something about it. But with that gift, we are a fallen people. We know that there is good and evil and that there are problems in the world that must be faced. Because let's be honest, the Great Commission is a lot of work. Loving your neighbor <laughs> is a lot of work. Loving your family is a lot of work. Doing justice and loving kindness is a lot of work. So where can we begin? Where do we get the perspective to know the next step, the right next step to take, without getting overwhelmed by opportunity, that robs us of our tranquility without having that lack of urgency and being just 
overwhelmed with apathy and complacency and just not being able to take that next step. There has to be a balance. And that's what I find in this story with Mary and Martha is there's the balance there. Yes, the preparations have to be made. He says few things are needed. But Mary's sitting at his feet taking time to be holy. We need a balanced life. And to have a balanced life, we can look to Jesus. Now, as a <laughs> to sum it up very small way, Jesus is mainly doing three things in the gospel. He's doing, you know, the healing, the feeding, the teaching, the preaching, raising folks from the dead. He's doing stuff, doing the work of God. He's moving. Jesus moved a lot. He liked to walk around. Sometimes he was on a boat, but a lot of times Jesus was a walker. He was moving to where the action needed to happen. And we have to think, we have to look at that, and if you read just the three years, two or three years represented in the Gospels, you have to think, where did he get that energy to do all that stuff? I mean, he was doing a lot. And healing people, you can see in the, in the stories, it takes a lot out of him. So where does he get that strength? Well, the third thing he was doing was praying and resting. One of my favorite passages right now is in the Gospel of Mark. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he, Jesus, departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. Because we see here Jesus starting off his day by spending time in prayer and spending time with God, grounding what's going to come in silence and listening and in the love of God. Before going out and doing his work, he departed. He went out to be alone. And to be away from all the distractions of his mighty mission, to be away from the numerous people that wanted something from him. And he started taking time to be silent. And he rose early to get perspective and to see the big picture. He started his day in prayer. And then only after that did he went out, go out and start moving and acting in the doing. So I ask you an uncomfortable question. What's your morning routine look like? What are you putting first? Are you starting your day off with God? Or are you starting your day off with the news? Or coffee? Or the snooze button? Because to follow Jesus, to follow anything means to put that thing first. And when we played follow the leader with the kids, and I got up and started walking, they immediately got up and started walking because Kids get it, right? They get the game, and they got it quick. Oh, we're supposed to follow Jesus. Yeah, that's right. It's so easy. Man, to have childlike faith like that. But to follow anything, you have to, be, you have to put it first. And when we start our day by following Jesus, we can allow him to lead us. When we seek time away from the hustle and bustle of everyday life, we can hear and prioritize the voice of God. We can actually hear that still small voice and then we can proceed with confidence and perspective that what we do will be God's will and not our own. We can focus on the few things that actually matter. So I ask, what, if, what would happen if we all did this? Just even in this room, woke up and immediately spent time with God. What would that look like if we sought first the kingdom of God, literally the first thing in the morning? And what if maybe even just give your first five minutes to God or your first minute or your first 30 seconds to acknowledge and celebrate the light and the creation and how you were fearfully and wonderfully made? What would, what would, what, where would we be in a day, in a week, in a year if we started by putting first things first? What could we accomplish for the kingdom of God if we truly put God first and followed him with our words and actions? When we allow our words to be grounded in silence, when we allow our actions to follow Jesus, each small step we take can be a giant leap of faith and can be in the right direction from the right perspective and be one of those few things that matter. So I challenge all of you and I challenge myself to start my day, start your day. Maybe it's prayer. 
Maybe it's a Bible verse of the day. Heidi and I are using the YouVerse app, the Bible in your pocket, which is super convenient because the first thing I do when I wake up is the phone. And having a Bible on the phone kind of hacks that and lets me go, oh, hey, let's go check out and see what, what's in there and spend some time with God. Or maybe you're like Matt, who is not here. We miss you, Matt. But he starts his day with meditation. But find something that works for you and add that routine, add that to your routine for a week. You could even just do breath prayers. You could even just wake up and just, Lord, have mercy and go about your day. That's a start. That's something. That's putting God first. See, next, next week, we're going to look at what follows this story of, of Martha and Mary and Luke, and that's the Lord's Prayer. We've done the Lord's Prayer in the adult Bible study. We've done the Lord's Prayer in the youth. We're getting through it because it's summer, and youth is hard in the summer. We're like halfway through the Lord's Prayer in there. And we're going to finish the story, the, the little book, the, the most important prayer book with the little kids. And then we're going to look at it together as kind of an overview. And I'm really looking forward to that. So maybe we start there. Maybe you can start each morning by praying the Lord's Prayer. And what I've been trying to do, trying to do, I'm in church, so I'm going to be honest. I don't do it every day, but I'm trying to get better at doing it. Sometimes I just say, Lord, have mercy, and then go about worrying about my day. But I'm trying to put him first. Maybe we can start each morning saying the Lord's Prayer. And what I've been trying to do lately is saying it line by line and thinking about what each line means. When we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, I try to take a minute and thank God for his abundant faithfulness and his creation that I get to be a part of and be grateful in that. And I go line by line, really trying to take time to be with God, take time to be holy, speak often with my Lord, let him guide us and lead us. And to do that, you have to put him first. Again, when we allow our words to be grounded in silence, when we allow our actions to follow Jesus, each step that we take can actually be a giant leap of faith. On the yellow table back there, the one with the pretty flowers, there's little business card looking things with the Lord's Prayer on it. Because if you find yourself trying to do this, or if you find yourself trying to say the Lord's Prayer with a bunch of kids repeating you, it's really easy to lose your place and go, what line am I on? So you can grab one of those little cards, put it somewhere where you wake up, and just for a week, wake up, pick it up. You can even look at it and go, oh, call it, oh, and walk away. But even just reading the first line, our Father who art in heaven, spend that first moment, give your first fruits of your day to God. Because to follow anybody, you have to put them first. Thanks be to God. Amen.